This is the first section of the hypothesis testing chapter uh, in the Applied Year 1 book and funnily enough it's called hypothesis testing this section. Uh, lots of writing here, I want to go for it so you make sure you understand. This topic often causes a lot of confusion and students don't really understand what they're doing or where they're doing it. So hopefully by the time we get to the end of this you'll have a better idea of what hypothesis testing is. Okay, so a hypothesis test is basically finding out if something has changed. Yeah, that's basically what it is. Finding out if something has changed. So has the mean changed or has the probability changed? So for example, if um, a shop was selling sandwiches and 20% of people bought the sandwiches and uh, they, they introduced a new recipe and uh, what happened the next day um, out of 50 people 10 people bought the sandwiches does that mean that more people are now buying the sandwiches has the probability of somebody buying sandwiches increased from 20% or has it decreased from 20% or has it changed? Yeah. So basically that's all a hypothesis that test does. Is there evidence to show that something is changing? And in this particular chapter, we're going to be looking at the probability. So when we do a hypothesis test, we're trying to answer this question. Has the probability changed? Yeah, and that change may be an increase, it may be a decrease, or it may just be a straight change as it, as it changed in some way. Has the probability increased, decreased, or changed in some way? So the probability of some uh, event. Now, this probability that we're seeing, if it's changed or not, is what we call a population parameter. Yeah, there are lots of different population parameters like mean and things like that. But in our case, our population parameter is going to be the probability. That's what we call our population parameter. Has the mean of the population, sorry, not the mean, has the um, probability um, of a population changed? Can I tell that by looking at a sample? Well, I need some sort of evidence to see whether the means change. So I'm going to do some observations, like look at a sample of people and observe what they're doing and count them. OK, so maybe out of 50, I noticed that seven are buying these new sandwiches. I count them. This is what we call our, our test statistics. So this is basically what we observe. OK, this is what we observe. So, for example, it might be that our test statistic and we normally use the letter X for our test statistic. It might be um, that this stands for the number of people. Of people. Buying. Uh, cheese sandwiches. Yeah, let's stick with our. I think they say you spell sandwiches. Um, let's stick with our example of the, the shop and the sandwiches. Our test statistic is right, how many people actually came in and bought these sandwiches out of, you know, um, uh, in, in the sample that I took of 50 people or 10 people. OK, so we've got our population parameter. In this case, it's the probability. We're looking at the probability, see if the probability has changed in some way. And then we've got our test statistic. This is the thing that we're observing. This is the thing that we're we're counting. We always need to say what it stands for. And with a test statistic, we normally use the letter X. What is the thing that we're observing? What's the thing that we are counting? So we know the probability of the population. That's the population parameter. And we're looking at a sample and we're using this sample to see what that probability is and using that to see whether it's 
change. It's almost like comparing the probability of the population with the probability of the sample. Well, first of all, we need to say what it is we're looking at. And um, we have something called the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. So the null hypothesis, we use the letter H0. Now the high, null hypothesis is basically what the um, probability is if there's no change, if nothing has happened, if um, the, pro the probability stays exactly as it is and there's no change, that's what H0 is. So H0 might be something like that the probability these people but normally by an A C sandwich or like P equals might be 0.3. So that's H0. Okay, this is what it normally is. Yeah, with no change. Whereas the alternate hypothesis, which we write as H1, is going to tell us what we are testing for. So it might be that we're testing to see whether more people are buying the sandwiches. So we'd write H1, the colon here, and the probability has this probability increased above 0.3. Are more people buying these sandwiches? So we've got our population parameter, we've got a test statistic, that's the thing that we're counting, the thing that we're observing, and we've got our null hypothesis what the probability has been up to this point and the alternate hypothesis, what we're checking to see. We're looking to see whether this uh, probability has changed. Now, the way that we work out our probability is by using a binomial uh, distribution and by using our calculators. We'll talk more about that level, uh, later on. But um, we have, let's go back to the um, what we call one tail and two tail test. Now, if I am checking to see whether there has been a, a decrease in the probability of something happening, or I'm looking for an increase in something happening, this is what we call a one tail test. If I'm looking for a change in the probability, which we'll write like this, it doesn't equal to something. Yeah, so it's changed, it could be an increase or a decrease. It's what we call a two tail test. Two tail test. And this is basically telling us when we work out the uh, probability are we going to work out the probability of something being greater or less than what we've observed that's what we're basically working out when we do these tests but as we go into the questions hopefully it will make a bit more sense now let's say for example let's go back to our sandwich shop that uh, people were buying sandwiches at a rate of 30% and I want to see, are more people buying my sandwiches? So H1, the alternate hypothesis would be, uh, has the proportion of people buying my sandwiches uh, increased? Okay, and I would say well, X, the thing that I'm counting, as I said before, let's say it was the number of people buying, let's just stick with sandwiches sandwiches again I think that's how we spell it and let's say uh, on a particular day I looked at 30 people that came into the shop and out of those 30 people uh, let's say that 15 bought the sandwiches 15 bought sandwiches OK, um, does this mean that more than 30 percent of people are buying sandwiches? OK, well, let's work that out. So this is where we use binomial. 
like this. Now, what was our sample size? 30. And what's our probability? 0.3. And I want to work out this probability. What's the probability that 15 or more people would buy my sandwiches with a sample of 30 and and the probability be, probability being 0.3 percent so let me say that again i'm working out the probability that 15 or more people buy these sandwiches if i took a sample of 30 at a probability of 0.3 percent so i'm testing h0 how likely is this to happen if the probability is 0.3 and I pick 30 people and 15 or more buy the sandwiches, what's the probability of that? How likely is that? So we're going to work this out on a calculator. Now, when I work that out, I actually get a value of 0.016. Now we want to go to four decimal places. Actually, I'll just write a few more. 1.693. Something like that. So the probability of this happening is roughly 1.7%. There's a 1.7% of 15 or more people out of 30 buying the sandwiches if the probability of buying the sandwiches is 0.3%. Now that 1.7, is that likely? Is that unlikely? Is, there, is that normal? Is it, unnorm is it not normal? I was going to say unnormal. The, the way to find this out is by using something called a significance level. And that's this last box at the bottom, significance level. The significance level is like our cutoff point. It tells us the probability at which we decide there's something wrong here. There's something dodgy going on. This isn't right. There is some sort of change going on. And this is like our, our cutoff. So, for example, if my significance level were 10%, basically anything below 10%, I count as being a bit odd, a bit strange. So that tells me something has changed. So if my significance level was 10%, that would tell me, hang on, there's something dodgy um, going on here, and which it is my um, actual probability value was 1.7%. 10% so that's well below 10% so that would tell me something has changed so I actually would say right let's go for h1 h0 is 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 dodgy it's not right what if my significance level was 5% okay if my significance level was 5% again I look at my 1.7% chance of that thing happening anything below 5% is abnormal strange so i would say well that's strange for h0 so but it's maybe it's h1 however in this particular example if my significance level were one percent i would say anything below one percent is strange and odd and there's some change going on but my value here is above one percent so I would say nothing wrong, it's fine, there's no problem. So I would say, well, let's go for H0. Now, that's a lot to take in. And as I said, students often find this topic tricky. The key to it is practice. And the key to it is realising you are looking to see whether the things that you observed and counted, is that normal or abnormal? for H0, for the probability that you would expect it to be. Right. John wants to see whether a coin is unbiased or whether it is biased towards coming down heads. He tosses a coin eight times and counts the number of times X that it lands to heads up on most. Describe the test statistic. Okay, so we'll normally use X. For the test statistics now what is it we're actually counting we're counting the number of times it lands on heads out of eight throws so there's our test statistic the 
number, then what are you observing or counting the number of heads in eight throws? Basically our test statistic, the thing that you are counting. Write down a suitable null hypothesis as well. What do we normally expect the probability of a normal coin to be landing on heads? A half. An alternate hypothesis. Now, we need to look again. It's going to be a half here, but we need to look. What does he want to see? He wants to check to see whether it is unbiased or whether it is biased towards coming down heads. Now, if it's biased towards coming down heads, what do we expect? Well, the probability of getting heads is going to be more than a half. So always read the question carefully. We're counting the number of heads in eight throws. And what we'll do later on is we'll do some maths and we'll work out. OK, I get three heads in eight throws. Does that suggest there's something wrong with the coin? OK, election candidate believes that he has the support of 40 percent of the residents in a particular town. The researcher wants to test at the 5% significance level whether the candidate is overestimating her support. So let's underline some things that are overestimating her support. Suggest um, she believes she has the support of 40% of residents in the town. 5% this significance level, so lots of thing here. The researcher asks 20 people whether they support the candidate or not. Three people say that they do. Part A, a suitable test statistic okay so what is the thing that we're counting or measuring so we use x now we are counting the number of people out of 20 that support the candidate and that's basically it yeah so the number of people we'll put out of 20 that support the candidate. So this is the thing that I'm observing, counting, measuring. I'm counting out 20 people. How many people support the candidate? There we go. So there's our test statistics. Part B says write down two suitable hypotheses. This is going to be H0 and H1. OK, well, H0. If there is no problem, she still has the support of 40% of the candidates. Now you can write this as a, a um, percentage or a decimal. When you when we do the calculations on the calculator, we'll be typing decimals in. Now we need to read the second bit carefully to work out what type of symbol we put in between the probability and 0.4 or 40%. Let's put 40% since we did that last time. And then the key word is this here. Um, to test at 5% whether the candidate is overstating her support. Now, if she's overstating her support, then actually less than 40% of people will support her. So the symbol we have there is less than and it can be quite tricky to work out yeah if she was underestimating her support then actually more than 40 percent of people would support her so you do need to re um, read it carefully and in part c it says under what condition would the null hypothesis be rejected well it would be rejected if the probability of three or less people out of 20 supporting the candidate if that probability was less than 5%. So let me write out it mathematically and then write it as a sentence. So with my binomial distribution, if I had 20 people and the probability of success, people supporting the candidate was 40%. And I work out the probability that three or less people support the candidate. If that probability 
is less than 5% are cut off, then this is when we say something is wrong, something is dodgy going here, then we would reject H0 because the probability has gone below that cutoff point. So you could almost think of it on a probability line like this with 0% here, 100% here, and we have some sort of significance level. Okay, let's just write SL for significance level. Let's say that was 10%. Anything below 10%, we would say, is too low to be normal. So we would reject the null hypothesis. We would reject H0. Anything above 10%, we will say that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong. We would accept H0. We'll say, okay, nothing's changed, really. Now you can see, as the significance level changes, so if this was higher or lower, it's going to change where, when we accept and reject H0. Yeah, it's going to change when we accept or reject H0. Right, you should now be able to do exercise 7A on pages 100 to 101 of the textbook.